we were just covering uh we ended on Ivan the Terrible and his legacy but I want to make clear again also just like in the beginning part of his rule he did a lot of things that were seen as positive by certain people um his his legacy like despite all of his terrors also you know depending on what you your value system is he was able to greatly expand uh, with his son the territory of Muscovy um, in a way that was very significant and I think again if you if you guys watch the movie and you get extra credit you'll see the way that uh, Stalinist Russia tried to portray Ivan the Terrible and the way that the documentary that we just watched and what you've read about uh, Ivan here okay so um, just keep that in mind um, there ended up being afterwards what's called the time of troubles and I'm just gonna briefly go over this just to say it's kind of an interesting time there's even a famous play about uh, this advisor Boris Godunov um, he's a brother-in-law uh, a ruling class turned ruler um, uh, basically there was one son left from Ivan the Terrible who was kind of slow and he was seen as pious and liked to ring bells and he didn't do much and it appears that Boris Godunov was the real uh, um, ruler but um, it, there was a lot of controversy during this time um, because basically Ivan's um, son, young son Dmitri was stabbed, they thought, in an intrigue by maybe Boris Goodenough. Um, but this man from Poland comes claiming to be the actually like Dmitri alive, not really dead, and returned. He promised 10 years of freedom from taxation and raised an army against Boris Goodenough. Uh, he rose to power as well. Now, I just want to say something about this. I think it's probably fair to say that many people knew that this guy was not really the uh, the survived Dmitri, but they probably wanted to believe or liked the idea of the concept because they wanted to rebel against Boris good enough. And so he comes to power and then Muscovites are upset because he marries a Polish Catholic woman. Now why is he, are they mad about that? Remember that in this time period um, just like we've t we've talked about in one of our uh, previous chapters about the way that Shiite and Sunni Muslim powers would compete with each other, kind of see each other as enemies. Remember the Western Church and the Eastern Church, so uh, Roman Catholic and the Eastern Roman or the Greek Orthodox branches are in opposition to each other. So they're afraid of a Catholic takeover, all right? Um, and so the... the, the Actually, let me just back up and say, so the issue is not about Protestants versus Catholics on this end, but about the Eastern Church versus the Western Church, okay, and uh, the, the noble powers that are involved with that. Um, he's killed by the nobles in Russia. They have his body hacked apart, and then they blow his ashes out of a cannon. So kind of intense, right, uh, reaction to this. There was another guy who then tries to come as an imposter. Um... Uh, there's a massive peasant revolt, uh, Polish and Swedish invasions ensue, and there's an 85-year-old church patriarch who helps drive out the Poles, okay, and uh, no doubt he mainly, uh, despite his age, was a kind of unifying factor in, in bringing everyone together, and the boyars, or the nobles of Russia, elected uh, Mikhail, or Michael Romanov, as Tsar, in 1613 he was a great nephew of Ivan the the terrible uh, was significant as is the Romanov dynasty lasted until 1917 when they were eliminated by the Bolsheviks or the communists in the revolution there okay so that's a little bit of history of Russian court intrigue and I'll stop there and I'll return back to uh, church life and social order.